uh, starting about a half hour early. Uh, there won't be one next week, probably, because I'll be kind of on the road doing stuff uh, for my birthday. And uh, then it'll probably be the week after that that we'll be able to get back on the swing of things. So um, nice here in Spokane. The weather has been cooler, although there's a bunch of fires around. So it's been smoky. We've got a wonderful temperature inversion for people with asthma. But uh, at the very least, the temperatures haven't gone up into the 90s and 100s like we were fearing a couple of weeks ago. We're only in like the 70s and 80s. And of course, the smoke from the fires. Anyway, um, continuing with Replacing Darwin. The book from which you won't learn a damn thing. Um, let's, uh, um, you can see our uh, uh, patrons up on the screen. I'd better cancel that out now that everyone can see the people that are helping make the old RJ muddle along week by week. I finished the second Paralogues of Fog novel and done a re edition of the first volume, which got all of that uh, little typos and stuff out of the way. And I'm just awaiting my. Uh, physical copies to come from Amazon, so I'll probably be sticking them up on the screen by the time I get back from uh, uh, the birthday vacation. And of course, continuing work on The Rocks Were There, all the wonderful, exciting years and years of acts and facts to process. Anyway, back to our topic at hand. Um, the continuing saga of the charts that all look alike in uh, Nathaniel Jensen. This time, he's going after lemmings, hamsters, and vole family, the Critcher today of which, no surprise, there was not a single reference in his regular bibliography that pertained to those uh, topics. So I decided to kind of poke around looking in there. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful paper from 2018 on one of the genuses in that area, the um, uh, Aegialimus uh, from Peru, that has a large distribution in South America and presumably are one of these things that are popping up uh, in the period prior to 700 BCE, which is the chronology that looks like uh, the case in his little chart. So somewhere in there, after the flood, um, all of these groups diversified, and a bunch of them obviously had to end up in Peru because they're there. Uh, the um, a paper that I'll be putting up from the Do Prado um, doesn't seem to fit his model much because it has the lineage going back over a million years and detailed by geographical information and all of that. So um, you can kind of compare that to the cartoon version that Jensen puts up. Uh, the part two part, uh, Jonathan Sarfati, um, just uh, a little ways ago, did a little piece here on, ooh, herbivorous therizinosaurs. And um, he uh, cites um, um, oh, some work from Zano uh, and um, a more recent paper by uh, Kobayashi, um, brand new technical paper on here, as though this were being done by creationists, which it isn't. Uh, they've had no point whatsoever on that. Uh, you can read their papers to find out the skivvy about why the meticulous logic of figuring out why this particular group of theropods has developed uh, into a herbivorous lineage, which is unusual uh, for the theropods, but obviously not impossible. Also, Therizinosaurs had feathers. That's a little sidebar, which is also part of the whole issue about how feathers are developing uh, in the uh, dinosaur lineage and the genetics and all of that. Yeah. So the funky part is that I regard this as pure parasitism, that they don't have an actual paleontology department at the ICR or AIG to be able to do any serious work. You find some creationists to do paleontology um, uh, that gets published even as legit material. Uh, some of the ones from Loma Linda University did some things on some whales that were found up in Peru. They, of course, has the, have their spin on it that they then put into the apologetics, but they're perfectly capable of doing actual paleontology. Todd Wood is a paleontologist, and um, uh, um, uh, the uh, a couple others that you can find knocking around in there who have done, even if they don't have full paleontology degrees. But the problem is, is that not much of them's doing much, and none of the ones in this area. So the creationists have not exactly set the house on fire when it comes to doing their models, but I find this kind of thing from Sarfati particularly scuzzy because 
he's just scavenging up, vacuuming up the work of people um, as if this somehow or other is going to help their case. And it doesn't. It's fun to fun to look in, though, and especially because so much of it is is actually uh, uh, documentable. Um, you can compare his treatment of uh, about the teeth. Um, just because something had slashing claws or sharp teeth, it doesn't mean it ate meat. And um, he's citing um, not a, a regular technical paper, but guess what? Jonathan Sarfati and uh, uh, Lydia Sender, uh, Cosner, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs had plant diet. In other words, just keeping within house. But in fact, the things that relate to diet and behavior are much more than just the slashing teeth. But because they can be used for a variety of circumstances, including fangs that are used to uh, act as display areas. But there's a way more to it. And look in the papers and they'll be describing all these little details in there. So you can compare the cartoon version of Sarfati with the much more sophisticated detail version of the actual technical papers, all of which are available in open access. So that makes it really quite nice to go into. And uh, so I put uh, links up, one from PNAS and the, uh, uh, the new uh, DePrado one. Uh, or the um, uh, the the older Zano ones, and then the Kobayashi one is is in um, uh, open access uh, scientific reports. Which, oddly enough, I think, yeah, he keeps on referring to as nature science reports, but technically that's not what it's called. It's scientific reports, and it happens to be put out by Nature. I've noticed he's been you know, um, misrep mistyping that for quite a while. Um, Maybe it's something to do with the website that he looks at or just because he doesn't read too closely, but that's Sarfati. So what would you expect? So um, <clears throat> we'll, um, we're hoping to get um, diving through the tail end of all the acts and facts material for the um, Big Sloss chapter. Um, and then I got to dive into the cosmology material, which have all that stuff sorted out. There's a chunk of the material from all this acts and facts stuff that's going to be referred to that. So I got to make sure I get up to speed. The thing that, that really strikes me about the creationist apologetics, and you see it so glaringly at AIG, but also at ICR with acts and facts, is the drumbeat repetition of the tropes. So when they have a particular dog... It'll be week, month after month after month, again, again, and again, and again, and again, constantly banging the drum, often citing the same sources without any uh, novelty, sometimes spreading out there. There's a section that we'll be going into on their cosmology, uh, where Vardaman and uh, a co-author um, had three long articles uh, in Acts and Facts about 10 years ago. And it's basically just saying what their position is. No scientific documentation that that position is actually true. Uh, and, but it's, and so it's all going into the point that if somebody um, subscribes to their journal and follows their doctrines, they'll get a constant massaging reinforcement brigade. And you find the same thing at Discovery Institute. Oh, hi, Nepercos. Wonder if they defer to older arguments because, oh, that's a very good question. There's, um, a complex mix of things in the creationist movement that uh, relate to that very point. Um, if you encounter somebody, by and large, there's an enormous amount of conservatism, and you, you've hit upon that in creationism. And they also have the fixed doctrine to deal. But there are schisms afoot in modern creationism. Uh, Randy Guliuza, who took over uh, as the head of um, Institute for Creation Research, has this obsession about natural selection. And um, uh, Joel Duff has done quite a few videos on this, and we're going to be alluding to this in uh, volume two of the Rocks for there. Um, we alluded to the natural selection schism uh, a little bit in, in volume one, but we will we'll be returning to it in volume two. Um, and you've got the issues about how much speciation you can have, um, whether or not catastrophic plate tectonics and a lot of these rescue mechanisms that the, the creationists try to come up with uh, are um, very plausible and uh, gaining any traction in the regular scientific community you, uh, or in the regular creationist community. And so um, D Duff is kind of nice in here because he keeps track of a lot of the ins and outs of stuff. Um, he monitors ICR and AIG and CMI, which is the 
fusioned group that came off of uh, Answers in Genesis. Uh, there's not much of creationism going on beyond that, other than the nutballs who, you know, the Kent Hovians and the ones that have uh, still think Ron Wyatt's um, uh, version of Exodus is correct and all of that. Um, those people tend to be very traditional and parasitical. And so um, if you find uh, certain tropes popping up that are typically only from very old creationist apologetics, um, the uh, ob ob objecting to plate tectonics and continental drift, for example, would be a dead giveaway because virtually no modern creationist goes that far. They've revised themselves on that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, that's so the lack of newer variety lately is because they don't want to step on each other's toes and split the camps first. To some extent, although you've got prickly personalities going in modern creationism, so there, there is... Um, <clears throat> Nathaniel Jensen, I think, just uh, put up a, and, and um, Joel Duff commented on it that he's left ICR precisely because he can't swallow Gulliuz's absolute um, rejection of natural selection. Because, you know, although ironic, because Jen, uh, um, no, I, no, I think it's Jeff, uh, I think it's uh, Jason Lyle, Jason Lyle, the, uh, the astronomer guy. And so, He's kind of out of his wheelhouse there because you'd think Guliusa should actually have a, a, a better uh, grasp on the subject than a creationist uh, cosmologist. But yeah, you know, um, and you get uh, um, a, a little bit of infighting on there. Another factor has to do with how many of them are very old. Uh, they're this level of old and uh, uh, they're still hanging along. Uh, you still find Jerry Berg and uh, Sarfati and Vardaman, they're all geriatrics like me. So you have um, a relative dearth of the younger generation, but an awful lot of them are falling into that new creationist mold that um, uh, Joel Duff has been talking about. And they're, they're kind of gravitating in that they're in the generation, I shouldn't say all that young, you know, they would be 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, but uh, the Todd Wood era of somewhat more recent ones that were starting to gel their thinking around the turn of this century rather than marinated back in Kent Hovind land back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so it's it's an ongoing thing. There is the central core of young earth creationism that never moves. You've got the flood, you've got um, the, a creation week that took place only 6,000-ish there's not a lot of debate about that. Pretty much uh, most of the public creationists uh, follow Bishop Usher's date of 4004 BC and uh, 2350, 2348 for the flood BC, um, 1500 BC for the Exodus. That's a dead giveaway that you're dealing with a conservative. If um, uh, they happen, if you bump into somebody who's very vague about their creationist doctrines, ask them when the Exodus took place. Because if they say 1500 BC, uh oh, you've got a conservative here because that's not fitting all the modern uh, scholarship in this area. Um, yeah, yeah. The um, uh, the primary structure of young earth creationism hasn't really changed in the last 50, 60 years. In other words, during my entire lifetime. But the fiddly bits um, still get troubles. Uh, for one thing, you've got the inherent problems with trying to figure out what species uh, have uh, differentiated and what um, uh, the chronology is working. A lot of these have been ticking time bombs that I've been expecting for years. Most of the Henry Morris era creationists didn't really bother much uh, doing a really any serious systematics. So biology, which was a term that was brought up by Marsh back in the 1940s or so, uh, didn't really get any traction until Todd Wood and Kavanaugh and the newer generation um, around 1999 started picking up all of this to, to make it sciencey because they're, 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 they're honest ones in that they really take this seriously. They believe it. And so they want that they, they're sure that the science, if they can just apply it, will work. Uh, that starts bogging them down along problems because um, they've got just such a colossal amount of stuff. The first shoe that's been dropping, of course, relates to the Noah's Ark, uh, that they really have an enormous incentive to keep the number of kinds low in order to fit them on the Ark. And that's why I suspect that the answers in Genesis format, which we'll be going into in Rocks 2, um, of about 1,500 kinds, which is roughly animal families, 
uh, with some wacky exceptions, um, is probably going to stay pretty constant even amongst the various newer groups of creationists because it's just too attractive. It, it, it's small, tidy, fits on the ark nicely, and they can always cite uh, replacing Darwin <laughs> to think that all of the current species that exist could have burst out since the flood without any problems. We got the genetics for that. Don't look too closely behind the man behind the curtain. But lurking farther out is the second shoe to drop. And that one hasn't really hit yet. And that is what went on from creation to the flood. Ever, for all practical purposes, all the fossil record has to have occurred in the roughly thousand years or so from creation to the time the big slosh comes along and buries it all in the flood. That's way bigger array of critters than even than and, and variety, dinosaurs, therapsids, all of this, that exists in the post-flood period, which is all the material that exists after the KT extinction. There's another little minor quibble that's occurring uh, in there. And I think ICR is the main, main contrarians here. There's a little clique at, at ICR. And again, Joel Duff has done stuff on it. We're alluding to this in the new book. Um, they would like to have, because fossils are fossils, right? So if fossils back in the dinosaur times had to be from the flood, don't the fossils in the post-flood period have to be from the flood too? That they that they got to pull that flood boundary down because the Green River um, is post-flood, I mean post-Cretaceous. So uh, you've got lots of things where there are spectacular logger statins and beautiful tissue preservations and all that, that they've got to have after the flood. The, uh, they can't have after the flood. They're uncomfortable with it. Whereas geologically speaking, the ones with some geological training really have problems going past that KT extinction uh, for the flood boundary. Um, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, uh, do creationists think anything not alive today died during the flood? Pretty much in practice that for all practical purposes, it's extremely hard. And if there are counter examples to this out there, gang, let me know, but I can't see any examples of where a serious fossil thing that involves the last 40 or 50 million years is something where they're just screaming, this occurs without a flood. They may mention some of these things for preservation, but they're really squishy about it. And that's uh, why uh, you can kind of cross compare the subject matter that pops up at ICR uh, versus the stuff that you get at CMI and AIG because they are not buying into that. They want to keep that divide between the Cretaceous. And then there's a whole little subgroup in that new creationism thing where they're basically throwing in the towel. And this is not a new thing. I mean, the people were saying this in the creationist movement uh, by 2010, certainly, that they can't tell when the flood starts and stops. It's that, that there's no demarcation zone, that the kind of geology that you're seeing in the Precambrian is the same sort of stuff that you're seeing later in the supposed flood times, and then later still in the post Cretaceous. Um, but it's if they can step back far enough and kind of squiggle it up and make their little charts and look at their mega sequences, we mentioned again a little bit of that in, in uh, volume one, they can kind of fit the cartoon into the frame. But that's about as far as they can manage to go on that. And um, it's going to be fun to see where they deal with that. Another issue that we're bringing up in the second book of the Vengeance is a thing that I have been just waiting for years for the shoe to drop. And it's now starting to, which is what the hell do you do with the Egyptians? And for that matter, every other ancient people that straddles the flood boundary. Because if there were the case that there were signs of antediluvian civilizations that were destroyed in the flood with an occasional Tyrannosaurus washed into the uh, ruins uh, and all buried underneath this blob of um, <clears throat> stuff that turns into rock and then somehow or other maybe you get a Grand Canyon carved through a section of it. Uh, that would be really spectacular, but that's not what we ever see in the fossil record and the archaeological record. And you, 
have a trope, which we, again, we're, are, we're having a discussion of the various flood legends around the world and how they're not really cracked up. They're, they're, a lot of them are mythological. Some of them are retellings of the Noah story. Some of them are related to tsunamis and perfectly natural phenomena and all that. And we're going into a lot of that in volume two of the rocks today. Um, but the big killer problem is Egypt because they have a very long chronology that and archaeology to match, and all the cultures that connect up to them, because you've got all of these things where somebody has a battle, and we know about the culture that was doing the fighting on their end, and they've got an archaeological record, so you've got the Hittites, and the Assyrians, and all these other stuff. Well, the pyramid building age straddles the flood zone. Oh, so they're building pyramids and not noticing the cataclysmic flood going on? So I was expecting that eventually creationists were going to have the light bulb go off or the gas lamp or whatever it is that is the illumination, the simple little candle, um, that they're going to have to realize they're going to, have to do something about the Egyptians. They can't let the Egyptians sit still. In fact, it's not just the pyramid part because the tradition of Egypt goes back into the pre-dynastic times to the time where they're just barely starting to write and long before they start building even the Saqqara pyramids. Um, they've got to pull all of that down post-flood. Why? Because of its continuity. That you can't have people making hieroglyphs and worshiping Anubis-headed gods and all this kind of stuff. And then the flood comes along and Noah and the kids migrate, or some of them, migrate back into Egypt, breeding like rabbits to build the civilization up. And then pick up and create a new civilization that looks just like the one that existed before the flood, even down to the language they have and the hieroglyphs and the religion and the, the, the all everything. Uh-oh, that won't work. So it's they have to pull all of that down. Functionally, they've got the same problem with the Chinese, and there's just hilarious stuff about how the creationists try to hijack uh, the, high, uh, the Chinese um, script system uh, as uh, somehow talking about the flood and Genesis and all that. And it's just, it, it's just uproariously funny. The crazy eight section you'll, you'll love. That's all going to be in an appendix um, in the um, uh, stuff on compending all these uh, flood legends and, and why they aren't what they're cracked up to be. It's, it's a delightful little romp. Um, so it's going to be a major um, section tackle. If you thought that volume one had, covered all the bases. Well, we covered a lot of the bases of what we brought up, but there's still more besides, and it's just rambunctious. And they never quit uh, in doing this, as you can see by looking up Answers in Genesis or ICR. They're re quite resilient. The fun part has to do with spotting these little contentious issues and trying to see how they deal with them. So the heat problem, which we allude to that again. We have discussed it in volume one, but it, it persists because, sorry to say, spoiler alert, if you try to compress everything in the geological record into the flood year, all those meteor impacts and continents moving around and all and radioactive decay speeding up, that's a sidebar as well. You melt the earth. There's too much heat. <laughs> you vaporize it. This, um, uh, although lower echelon creationists, your, your grassroots nutballs like standing for truth. Um, oh, yes, yes. This, oh, oh, the, well, of the, the one they pretend that don't exist, which is the, oh, heat, the heat problem. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. That they're, the, all the rest are sidebars because vaporizing the planet in a ball of gas <laughs> is, is really a, a serious hurdle. And creationists know uh, at the upper echelon level, uh, way above standing for truth. They've been knowing about this problem and they've, they've come up with occasional ad hoc explanations. Uh, Russell Humphreys was thinking maybe the expansion of the universe really lickety split would kind of suck the stuff out. The problem is the universe is so gigantic and the expansion rate would have to be so accelerated that the amount of heat that would be presumably dissipated that way would be, would fr freeze the planet. So, you know, they're caught one way or the other. It's a mess. So you have groups of creationists in-house who know full well that catastrophic plate tectonics won't work or that accelerated decay won't work or that, that one of the other various points. 
uh, are in a problem of uh, the uh, uh, hydroplate theory that uh, Walt Brown has that basically nobody pays attention to anymore except Kent Hovind and people who watch Kent Hovind videos. Uh, Joel Duff did a discussion on that just recently as well. So knowing, having your, your creation as bingo card um, is more than just a little spot bit that you can actually differentiate camps within the creationist community and the chronological sweep of things. Um, encountering old farts like me in the creationist community is less and less. Most of the people that you're being encountering today are your young uh, Turks, like Standing for Truth and Matt Powell and all that, who are, uh, I practically got pants older than they are. Um, and they're, of course, gleaning primarily from the internet version of creationism, as opposed to the old hard text stuff. And that's why they don't know about this stuff in the same way that a Donald Trump voter doesn't know about the history of Donald Trump, because they're only looking at what they're seeing online. So dynamically, most grassroots modern creationists, unless they're old farts that have been at it for quite a while, are functioning rather more like a YouTube flat earthers, to where they will be siphoning off material that they've gotten on the internet and copy and paste and put all together. I mean, if you look at Standing for Truth's books um, and that, that he and Matt Powell and uh, stuff have done, holy smokes, these are just hilarious messes of, of cut and paste gibberish, including hyperlinks and stuff, which doesn't make any sense in a print book. Um, they haven't quite got the, the hang of it. And I think would, they would probably be bored if they tried to go through the Dwayne Gish and Henry Moore stuff from the 1980s and 90s, because it's like old fashioned stuff that the text they would have no particular problem with, but they'd slam into a technical citation from an actual magazine, a journal. Uh, and can they f locate all of that stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a fun little, little thing to ferret through. And, um, uh, yeah, keep keep an eye on the heat problem as the uh, bit when they're now below the heat problem. Um, I frankly put that Egyptian chronology issue uh, really high on the field because that's dumping you straight into human history. Now you're not talking about dinosaurs and stuff that existed outside of the range of human experience. Now you're dealing with things that are definitely human experience. And so the, the, the inability to make any sense whatsoever out of the chronology in this area. And that then brings in aspects of the theology. Um, the, the Exodus matter, as I mentioned, that 1500 BC date, as opposed to 1200 BCE, which would be the standard um, uh, of thing that's done up with the fact that the Exodus story refers to stuff relating to the Ramesses, Pi Ramesses and all of that. That's New Kingdom stuff. That's not 1500 BC Egypt, that's 1200 BC. Now, any attempt to try to squish the chronology in is running into the same problem that you do when you're trying to put all of these uh, fossils in a, in a time frame. Is uh, uh, if you start running into weird compressions and uh, chronological problems. I bump into that and think about that so much because, spoiler alert, I'm from a historical background. That's my gig. That's what I was trained in in college. And so the, the, the essence, all of my CDs behind me, my classical music, they're all in chronological order by the, by the year that the composer was born. So way up on top, there we go. Way up on top would be the Renaissance and then the Baroque and then into the uh, classical period and then into the early Romantics with Beethoven on. And then we move down into the middle Romantics like Brahms and Tchaikovsky and then down into the late Romantics like Mahler and, and Sibelius and then into the modernists and some little modernists over into here. There's people born after 19 or uh, 1875 if we want to throw in Charles Ives and, and Schoenberg, uh, 1880s on basically. Um, <clears throat> And um, so I've been used to thinking in that same way. That I do the same thing in my movies, the little DVDs and stuff. Oh, I'm pointing in the wrong. There we go. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, science fictions and mysteries and all of that. I put, uh, there's science fictions up there next to Paralogs. Um, they're in the sequence the movies came out, not alphabetically. I, I have a, a frightening tendency to think in chronological terms all the time. And one thing I noticed long before I started doing all the Troubles in Paradise research on creationism, but was beginning to notice when I was just looking at this back in the 70s and 80s, is they're really bad at history. 
Oh, they're terrible at it. And this is true over in the intelligent design movement too. None of them think chronologically over in the Discovery Institute. They, they may know blips. Steve Meyer will mention the Cambrian and so on and so on. But the idea that any fossil that you bring up exists in a moment in time in a geographical landscape that you would have to understand in order to make sense of it and then somehow to apply your um, a model to it, they never get to that stage because they don't think chronologically. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, um, just had a thought about the ancient Egyptians. Even if Noah's kids did know hieroglyphs when they arrive in Egypt, when they say, wait a minute, everything written here is wrong. Ah, exactly so. Why don't we see the, whoops, there we go. Um, why wouldn't we see them telling this thing? Another, another thing that we'll be bringing up in volume two, the Egyptians don't have a flood legend. At least nothing even remotely like that of the Noah story. Uh, they've got a flood thing involving a goddess that gets drowned in red beer. It, their various versions. It's very wacky. It would make for a very lurid uh, story if you tried to deal with it. Um, and that's as close as they can get. Other than that, the Egyptians have something that's very distinctive of ancient cultures that were on a river. They love the flood. Oh, the Nile is flooding. Yay! That, that it's the one culture where the flooding of the Nile was so predictable, so regular, that it was life-giving. They could Everyone would pack up and leave their farms when the floods come in, and they would help build pyramids and do all sorts of crap for the kings. Uh, and then after the water settled, the surveyors would go out. That's part of the reason why they had to develop written language, to be able to know where the damn farms were and mark everything out and then resume having fun until the next inundation next year when the serious dog star rises. It's all on schedule, kids. Isn't that wonderful? Except once in a while, climate blips on a larger scale El Nino's out in the ocean and all that would affect some of these things. And occasionally the Nile doesn't flood on schedule. Mm. They hate that because it means drought and it means famine and it means pharaohs being toppled and dynasties falling. That's what happened in the end of the Middle Kingdom and all of that. So um, flood, good, not flood, bad. Exactly the opposite as you would have expected if Mizrae and his kids were the ones responding there. And another feature, how fast did population grow? Um, back in the Henry Morris era, the only issue that they kind of thought about was at the other end, how can you breed eight people into the existing population in enough time? Well, if you you presume they don't get sick from illness and they breed like rabbits and do incest on a colossal scale, um, then you can get the curves up and match up okay. But the problem is at the beginning, you only got Noah and the six kids. <laughs> How do you get enough people to build pyramids and Babylonian stuff and Chinese stuff? and stuff over in the new world, Olmec pyramids and stuff. How can you expand that population base fast enough to do the things that we can see in the archeological record? And why aren't we seeing that reflected in their legends and in the physical evidence of how many people were living there and all that kind of stuff? They're never going to get to that level of making sense out of that because it's never gonna make sense. The example that I've used before, and I'll put it up here again because some of the newer viewers may not have seen it, um, relates to, um, oh, yes, they didn't have child. Well, it's worse than just the child labor laws uh, there. Uh, they've also got um, they've also got the incest issue. And um, fairly early on in creationism, they had to kind of go incest okay because you've got Adam and Eve starting out in Eden and where are they coming out? Don't they have to be, make more kids uh, before they start having wives? And, uh, it, and is that inbreeding a little bit of a problem? Well, because Adam and Eve's genes were so perfect, they were just coming out of creation. And another little tiny little detail, it's, it's, it's impossible to decide, even in theological terms, they don't really head scratch too much about this. But how long, 
was it that Adam and Eve were in Eden before they got kicked out because of the apple thing? Was it like a year, two, five years or less months, days, weeks? The Bible is totally vague on this. And you can find some people thinking that maybe they were only there like a week or two and then they were out on their ears. That's that's not a very uh, long lasting Eden going on. And then, of course, where is Eden? Uh, you still find that uh, this uh, old earth creationist and, uh, can kind of f fiddle with this fart uh, too, just as much as young earth creationists can. It, curiously, intelligent designers don't seem to pay any attention to a lot of these things, although individual ones will skirtle around in the area. But the kinds of things that are in the, the typical biblical Old Testament stuff, where it was Eden, um, where exactly were the rivers that washed into there, where uh, if there was an ark of some kind, and even in a local flood, where was it? How many animals did it carry? Blah, blah, blah. Um, that stuff for all practical purposes is just non-subject um, in intelligent design circles. Uh, uh, Bill Dembski kind of scratched his head over it a ways back when he was trying to suck up to Henry Morris, but um, nothing much came from that direction. And the intelligent design camp probably has decided there's no point in making a big deal out of any of this stuff because by accepting the old earth chronology, they're off the reservation right away. They, 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 the um, uh, creationists uh, doctrinally can't allow that. That's one of those things that's non-negotiable. No millions of years, maybe 10,000 at the outside, but no more. That uh, And um, so they're forced into that thing. So... Um, in dealing with any anti-evolutionist then, you want to try to ferret out where they actually are on there to put them on the landscape. Uh, and you do that uh, beyond some of the comments that come up because you can find people of all anti-evolution stripes uh, talking about irreducible complexity. But if they start bringing up uh, radioactive dating is wrong, uh, that's probably a young earth creationist. So that narrows it down. And so you can target the kinds of issues you want to respond with based upon where they're coming in. Some of them can be very generic. The whole idea of uh, whether anything can be designed, whether uh, irreducible complexity is even a thing. Uh, you can see that genetic entropy argument uh, from uh, uh, John Sanford. Uh, he's a young earth creationist. That's starting to filter in in a kind of cleaned up version um, uh, in intelligent design apologetics. And he's co-written some stuff in intelligent design articles on this kind of stuff. So, oh, hello, Ian. Hello. Yeah, that's a good time for you down there in the other side of the of our flat or taco-shaped earth, as the case may be. Yeah, it's been a, um, a hectic couple of weeks there because I was um, uh, desperate to try to finish off uh, the, the second Paralogues novel to get that out of the way, but that's now done. And I'm now putting myself back into full operating mode because the, 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 um, oh, 6 p.m. there in, uh, yeah. um, the, the headspace that I have to go into when I'm writing on anything tends to be fairly obsessive and I can handle a, another project, but it goes in a sidebar. So uh, the, the second Paralogs novel turned into a six-year project instead of a six-month project because I was doing these other books and uh, researching this new version of that and also planning out all the varying subsequent books that's going to carry on through um, from there down to 1908 and beyond. There's a bunch more going on in there. But at any rate, it's about at least a dozen books in the whole series. And now I'm hopefully at a stage where I've got so much of the structure done that I can wing the science projects and keep my head pretty focused on that while generating the material for the other books so that I can theoretically come out with a fog novel about every two years, three years, maybe something in that realm. But we'll see how that's going. So um, it's, uh, it, it, and it's a nice thing for my relaxation mode because if I'm getting a little frazzled on working on any of the science issues and juggling and making sure all the sources are pinned down and following up on little sidebars and making sure everything is referenced and the index is all complete and all that um, for the, um, uh, the non-fiction stuff, I can always jump away to the fictional world where I'm in control of things and I can follow up on my characters and write pithy little dialogue and clever little scenes and all that kind of stuff in a completely different mind mode. And uh, so there we go on that, that front. Um, 
it's going to be interesting to see in, in, in what the next 10, 15, 20 years holds. Uh, an awful lot of the people in the ICR are getting old. They're, they're occasionally putting out grumpy things, although you, you'd never tell it from their apologetics. When you look at their pictures, they always make a point of having a racially diverse group of very young people who just look like they just stepped out of uh, a, uh, a Starbucks. Um, but um, uh, it's a, a different kettle of fish when you look at that. And it's true also for a lot of the people in a Answers in Genesis. That there's a small number of newer apologists that are coming along. And to the extent that some of them are flirting with the new creationism, revisionism bits, they're going to be at loggerheads over doctrine. But the fundamental stuff, the, the global flood, the 6,000-year-ish creation event, no creation functionally after creation week. So everything that happened after the creation week has to be just natural variation within a kind and don't bother me with the detailed stuff. Um, it'll be fun to see um, the genetics end of it uh, because you've got the ones who do have pretensions, Jensen and, and Sanford and Carter and all the rest. Carter, for example, just ripped into uh, Nathaniel Jensen's new book uh, saying, you know, oh, no, no, you, you're coming up with preposterously recent dates for some of these alleles that uh, I, I can't even buy that, <laughs> you know. And so um, it's it, we'll be alluding to all of that in, uh, in the new book and that in all the human evolution section. It's it's fun. So it's it certainly keeps me busy. And, and the nice thing about what I've been doing. And thank you, Ian, for being one of the contributors to the uh, to the project. Um, uh, that that patronage every month makes a big difference between scraping by in panic and figuring out, oh, I can afford ink this month. Isn't that delightful? Um, and uh, I've also gotten a little bit of side bits. I've done a lectures uh, on um, the church-state separation issue uh, here in Spokane from a uh, Seattle university. That's kind of a religious college. Uh, and I got, um, I found my, and wiggled my way into that. And that has um, uh, given me a little extra fun. So I should be able to get some new glasses pretty soon. And um, uh, so anyway, unlike all of my previous life before my retirement, uh, now at last, while I'm retired, I'm busier than ever. And I'm doing stuff I really love. And writing all this material and interact with all of these people and realize there are people all around the world that um, can see my little mug, even if it's not a gigantic uh, viewership. I'm way less than typical flat earthers and, and the average creationist. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm here and it's there and it's going to be documented and the books are out there. Oh, Command Cyborg. Hello, world. Yeah. Oh, yes. With a little, I see you've got the... Uh, um, Slight, I'm trying to see whether or not that, yeah, that's uh, looks like uh, what's his name, the little robot from uh, 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 3000 Mystery Science 3000 on there for a minute. There, the top of it looks a bit like um, uh, the uh, robot from Lost in Space, which is a model version of the one that was in Forbidden Planet. Now we'll go into science fiction sidebar mode here, designed by a Japanese uh, um, designer who did all the spacecraft and stuff for that, and it's very, very distinctive. Uh, anyway, I always liked um. Uh, the snarky nature of, uh, of uh, 3000. And um, that's, as anyone knows, I, the, one, the one thing that uh, I have to kind of rein in is that snarky humor in the nonfiction stuff. But I can be droll and witty as all get out um, in the uh, Paralog series because I, can, I don't have to worry about that end of it. So anyway, um, that kind of covers a lot of the material. Has anybody got any questions out there? Yes, they, um, uh, the, I anticipate uh, we should, with some luck, uh, be able to uh, uh, do the new book um, in um, summer of 20 or summer or fall of 2023, uh, because there's still an awful lot to do on it. And um, uh, there's a massive material. We want to make it as up to date as possible. And we want as many anvils in there that we can drop on people. But it's it's going to be the most delightful all the material on the, uh, some just brand new papers uh, relating to the evolution of tetrapods uh, that's going to be figuring in that chapter. There's always new stuff appearing on the uh, human evolution when we want to make that super duper accurate and up to date. We'll probably be swinging by the, the text by Erica uh, got given to uh, look over the material to make sure we're all up to speed and uh, all of that. And then there will be a couple books in the years after that Jackson and I have on the agenda. Uh, the one on the whole 
uh, conspiracy theory uh, mindset uh, from flat earthers to vaccine deniers and all that, um, that um, uh, goes into the dynamics of that. And then there's uh, another work that um, we'll probably be doing after that, which is on the origins and evolution of religion and the evolutionary structures and the brain systems and stuff that are going on that, as well as the history of how it's swirled around and will be wanting to deal with more than just the Judeo-Christian thing. It's religion and its whole larger context because it's more than that. Um, oh, ooh. That's actually not off topic at all. That's an excellent question. Not to dive too deep into politics. Since when has that bothered me? I did a whole video comparing Kent Hovind with, with Donald Trump. So, yeah. Uh, do you think that creationism of the 2020s and 2030s will get pulled around by culture shifts in the U.S. surrounding MAGA? Um, not as much as you might think. Uh, we have to remember that anti-evolutionism has a very rigid demographic. With very few exceptions. It's culture war, Kulturkampf, religious, conservative. And by conservative, we're talking capital C conservative, hyper conservative, people who would make uh, Attila the Hun seem like a lefty. Um, and this uh, Kent Hovind is an example of that. These are, are uh, who still are fighting communism in their heads. Um, they're uh, largely um, anti-environmentalist that goes all the way back certainly to the Jerry Falwell era in the 1970s and we still see it in the opposition to uh, climate change today um, ranting on about windmills and and bringing snowballs in like in Hoffa did you know that oh, see there's no global warming there's a snowball here um, and um, the uh, uh, that demographic is not likely to change um, you can count the number of non culture camp conservative religious anti-evolutionists on one hand and have fingers left over. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was a progressive in the Scopes era, he would be a Bernie Sanders type politically if it weren't for his anti-evolutionism. Everything else about him is very left wing. That stands out like a sore thumb. Then you've got um, non-believers like Michael Denton and David Berlinski uh, and... Um, and you've got kind of non-believer Richard Milton, who's sort of a functional young earth creationist without being religious. So I got four and I still have a thumb left over to go with. That's not a lot. Out of thousands of people that I have in my reference bibliography um, and millions of anti-evolutionists around the, um, the globe, most of which are in the Anglo world and uh, in England and the United States and uh, the like, but it's spreading around. You have a Brazilian intelligent design advocate. You've got South Korean um, intelligent design and creationists. Uh, you've got um, a sprinkle of them in a lot of different contexts. And this is usually filtering through their church environment. So this now then slides along the evangelical um, daisy chain. Um, and you find the same thing happening uh, uh, subterranean with uh, the uh, Adventists who are kind of ambivalent about their creationist past. They haven't disavowed it, but they're, they've got kind of a new generation. So there may be some winkles going on in that realm. Um, and then the Mormon church, which um, has a full out creationist at all in there, but yet you've also have very left-wing uh, people and uh, politically liberal in that bunch uh, that uh, tend not to be anti-evolutionist. So those, uh, what changes that you can see, the MAGA crowd, as far as I can tell, I've encountered a whopping two um, creationists who are not Trump supporters. There, I'm sure there are more than that, but the ones that I bumped into on internet and other areas, um, there's John Mark Reynolds, who is an intelligent design, young earth creationist, who is a Russian Orthodox and definitely not for Trump, didn't like Trump. And then there's um, uh, Paul Dubisson, who's a, a wacky little internet troll creationist that's been knocking around for quite a few years. He's also inexplicably, he doesn't like Trump. But in terms of how much Trump pandered to the evangelical community over abortion issues and delivered with the great assistance of Mitch McConnell, a bunch of anti-abortion judges on the Supreme Court and in the other court system in general, um, he's got that demographic locked down as a support base. That um, he's their King Cyrus. And so they will overlook all of his faults uh, pretty much steadfastly. And, and because that block, the Tony Perkins crowd, 
are um, young earth creationists, hyper conservative Republicans. Um, they're not going to be altering that anytime soon. So there's the picture of it. Uh, whether there would ever be a viable left-wing anti-evolutionism, the only area where it kind of pops in is in evolutionary things about the uh, behavior, where you can see uh, genetic backgrounds to some things and that that kind of smacks of you, the eugenics things, and you kind of, some left-wingers don't like that aspect in principle, and you get a little bit of that, but it, it doesn't entrench very deeply on an evolution issue. Um, oh, okay. Let's see another one there. Do, 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 do. Uh, so that they've got too much focus on bashing evolution to get attached to other conspiracies. Yeah, until you get down to the grassroots. When you get past the doctorate level, for so you can look at a contrast between um, AIG uh, and where they will be perfectly happy with recommending people get vaccine vaccinated for COVID, down to Epoch Times which would be perfectly happy to have people not get vaccinated because they're in the um, Epoch Times is from that Falun Gong group over in China uh, that um, uh, gets in trouble with the Chinese government and all that. It's possible to be nutball and still get in trouble with the, uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese government shouldn't be persecuting people, even Falun Gong. Um, but you've got uh, that element going on. And when you get down to the grassroots level, you start seeing them falling all over the place in oddball stuff. That's where you'll encounter the flat earth creationists uh, and uh, geocentric creationism, which has been a thing for years. And there's maybe a few percentage of the United States that are, are geocentrists, including Tom Willis, uh, the guy that wrote the um, Kansas uh, standards, and he's still knocking around Kansas anti-evolution standards back in 1999. So again, there's a, a complex scorecard to play around with that in judging what grassroots anti-evolutionists do, you can't pay too much attention to what's going on up in the upper tier. Because look, a, a thing I do, and everybody that's that's bumped into the Twitter and uh, internet um, uh, anti-evolutionists will find people who say, well, why are there still monkeys? Well, that's an argument so bad that Answers in Genesis a decade ago uh, put up a post saying, no, 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 don't do that. Yet you still find lots and lots of creationists using it. What does this tell us? They're not reading Answers in Genesis, are they? <laughs> They're not Googling this issue. They're not doing background research. They're not relying on the authority first to find out what their position is. Um, the, uh, oh, the thing about uh, yeah, Trump being an atheist, yeah, I, I, I would be shocked if he were honestly a believer. Uh, we certainly know from scuttlebutt that's come out that he's very contemptuous of the younger, uh, of the religious so he would do his little prayer thing with them. And then afterwards he's saying, these people believe this stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's fascinating how the evangelicals are so blind spotted about the abortion issue that they just don't pay attention to that. In the same way that he's contemptuous of veterans who died during wars because they were the, the stupid ones who uh, got killed as opposed to smart people like me that got the bone spurs, you see? So that's the thing there. Um, and but, you, but when you look at his military supporters, these are culture camp ideologues, uh, General Flynn and others, you get a, a, a very tight demographic going on in here. Um, yeah, you wonder what, it, yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is fascinating. Um, guess what their end game is since I don't see them getting evolution thrown out. Yeah, they're, they're the capacity for limitless rationalization is limitless in creationists. And that's true of any Tortukan ideologue. Um, I wanted to put this one up in here about the damage control for optics. That's another good point. Um, do creationist organizations do a lot of damage control for optics or do they think they're winning their war as the vanguard? They're, they're, they can feed off of the same thing that a Donald Trump does in the political environment. It's an incredible insularity that I would guesstimate from my experience, three quarters of all anti-evolutionists will never ever see anything outside of the filter of their doctrinal base. So they will have their Institute for Creation Research magazines and they will have their answers in Genesis books and they will scavenge those. And so they will believe themselves familiar with the science data 
because their secondary apologetics has filtered the science data for them. So the, the, the upper mid-level uh, grassroots creationist is ones that will regurgitate stuff they've taken from Michael Behe or Nathaniel Jensen. Standing for truth is, is at a lower echelon, but it's the same process going on. And um, so if you're operating within that very insular frame and you're hit with something outside the frame, we know from the psychological literature that there's the circle, the wagon syndrome, and teachers have a problem with this issue in trying to get past dogmatic positions that students might have, that if you just throw information at them, it just bounces off and actually causes them to be more rigid and embrace the belief even more tightly. It's like a skater starting to spin faster. And uh, um, there are ways around that. They involve way more patience than I'm willing to do. And uh, uh, there are ways that you can kind of tease them in with a little individual data point that can act as the seed corn that will cause the, the wall to crack. But if they're a Tartuque in mind, that wall ain't never going to crack. And uh, so that's what we're dealing with. And you can see that so relentlessly when you're dealing with Trumpistas who are um, often creationists, but they, if they aren't creationists, they think exactly like creationists. They just repeat tropes and they don't know anything about that. What I try to do in my interactions with them is to um, come up with, and everybody can do this, by the way, in their own areas of expertise, is you find out where the dogmatist is not thinking about something and find a way of framing a question that forces them to think about the thing they don't want to think about. You have to know, by the way, that background extremely well. And this also gives you a great deal of confidence when you do that, because you're not having to trawl around. Don't try to engage somebody if you don't already know the material quite well. Uh, bear in mind, you have to just show humility in this area. I, um, I can kind of cringe at some of the early work that I was doing 20 years ago, uh, when I didn't know nearly as much as I do now. And I'm way more confident, even writing a whole bloody book on it, The Reptile Mammal Transition, which I regard as the gold standard of how you can just hit with a macro evolution case that they won't know diddly squat about. And I know all the material they could theoretically know on the creationist side. Um, yeah, oh yes, that, so yeah, getting them off script. Uh, for one, some can't be got off script. Some, I bumped into them in various contexts at, at meetings where they might be haunting a, a anti evolution or an, a pro evolution speaker and they will come up with their little questions written out in very tight things. Uh, if you try to interact with them, what you ultimately get is the deer in the headlight look, where you're forcing them to think about a thing their brain doesn't think about. And so they are in a wheel spin mode until they can get back on their apologetic track at which point they'll have something to say, but it won't be responding to your question. So this is a way of measuring the Tortukan mindset. Now, the ones that have some fun potentially are ones that don't try to convert them, but try to prod them to start doing source checking thing. And uh, many of the people that we know from the interviews that Dapper Dino has had and the experiences that we have, Erica Gutzik Gibbon is an ex-creationist, Dapper Dino is an ex-creationist. They, they were raised in that background. And at some point, they start noticing that the world of the data field isn't matching up with their model. And some of them have like a bloop, it just falls off the cliff. Some it's just a gentle erosion. And then one day they realize, yeah, they don't really believe it anymore. Uh, it varies from person to person and context to context. The ones I feel most sorry for are ones whose families are judgmental about it and they won't have anything to do with them. Fortunately, there are surprisingly large numbers of examples of ex-creationists whose families actually still love them and they can still you know, sit down at Thanksgiving together. They may not want to discuss the creation evolution issue, but that's at least a, a, a good sign on that. And that uh, kind of gives me hope that at least some of the people who are not Tortugans uh, will be able to find their way. Because for one thing, the real science world is so bloody interesting. It's so exciting and wonderful. I'm old enough to remember the, the relatively limited understanding we had of so many things. If you go back and look at um, science books and astronomy texts and biology material from the 50s and 60s, 
compared to what we have now in terms of the nuts and bolts of how things work. My God, we can see planets around other stars. Holy moly. Within my lifetime. Um, that it's just a delightful thing. And we have accessibility to information on such a scale at no cost, because I don't have money to, to blurb around on that. That was a thing that hampered me when I was starting out, uh, having to go and photocopy the article at the college library at 10 cents a shot. Uh, you know, that was just ridiculous. Now download the PDF, boop, and away we go. Uh, so nobody has an excuse for not having access to the information if they have access to the internet. And so if they can watch cats playing piano videos, uh, they can probably gain access unless they live in a culture where there is restriction on that. And some of the people that I was talking to in those lectures I was giving on church state issues, uh, some of them are from countries that have limitations on some of their internet accessibility. And they see it as just as big of a threat, that information throttling as I do uh, in a society where I can still get at all that information. So there we go. Oh, we're Pat. We did a whole bloody hour of evolution hour this time. Isn't that absolutely delightful? So, um, I think we got a good coverage on that. As soon as this gets posted, then I'll put in the links uh, so that everybody can follow along. No show for next week, but we will be back a week after that, uh, with all uh, things working out at which point I'll be able to show my editions of Phileas Fogg, uh, to everybody. And, and um, if you like fiction, uh, while we're waiting for the next Philly, uh, um, uh, the next uh, Rocks for Their volume to come out. If you like fiction, you like mysteries, you like science fiction, you like the steampunk area, the Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, I got some books for there. Uh, you'll be able to take a vacation to the 1870s that won't be like anything you'd ever read before. I'm quite delighted at how the second book turned out just as much fun and satisfying for me as the other one. And I'm hoping to do 10 more in that vein uh, until I drop dead. So anyway, hi, Brian. Time to say missed it again. Yes, yeah, you'll have to catch it from the beginning on there. So um, uh, this one went off just absolutely beautiful. I'm thinking about some techniques about how to keep Wi-Fi from having a knip fit. Uh, and um, hopefully that'll be able to work out on that. Eventually, I'm going to have to get a whole new PC because my old one doesn't have the newer versions of Windows and they're not even going to do the old version, the Windows 8 that I kept with. So I'm going to have to probably by the early part of the year, get a whole new computer system. So I got to start pricing around for things like that. So anyway, but at least I'm not struck by lightning. Um, the, uh, 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 we're not flooded out like the poor Pakistanis. We don't have the droughts and things, Californian fires. We got some in Oregon and that that's going on and some up in Washington state, but it's not as bad as it was a little while ago. So things could be worse. Okay. Don't accept any wooden penguins. See ya in two weeks.